Recently, Derek from More Plates More Dates released a video reviewing Logan Paul's Prime Hydration, basically saying how it wasn't a great drink for people who are working out. And you know what? I don't tend to disagree with him. In the same video, Derek talked about his supposed superior electrolyte formula called Gorilla Hydration. So in this video, I'm going to be breaking down that product, but also giving you the tools to understand electrolyte supplementation so you don't ever have to ask what's the best one ever again. If you're new around here, my name is Adam McDonald. I'm a registered performance nutritionist with an MSc, a natural competitive bodybuilder, and a high performance coach. In this channel, we break down complex health and fitness topics into practical application. This video is not targeted towards individuals with diseases or illnesses that affect hydration or electrolyte status, but more so for otherwise healthy individuals who exercise. Electrolytes are essentially minerals that dissolve in water and they can conduct an electrical current. And they are essential, meaning we need to get them through our diet to avoid disease and impaired immune function. We lose these electrolytes in very small amounts through our urine and in larger amounts through our sweat. And the research in this area is lacking, which has opened up a market for supplement companies to sell speculative products. Now, before I get into this, I want to say that as a YouTube consumer, I really like more plates, more dates, but I also spent a lot of time studying electrolytes during my masters. And I don't think that Derek should be immune to scrutiny. Let's first look at Derek's product compared to Element, because I already have a video that broke that down and you can find it here. If we look at both labels side by side, we can see that per serving, both supplements are pretty similar. The main differences are Element contains about half the potassium, half the magnesium, and none of the other ingredients, which come in very small amounts. Even though the label doesn't say it, Element contains about 1500 milligrams of chloride. We can work this out by the fact that it says it contains sodium chloride and contains 1000 milligrams of sodium because sodium chloride is 60% chloride and 40% sodium. You see, here's the thing. You have all these different companies changing the amounts of this and adding a bit of that, but they fail to realize one thing. The only trace element that research has shown to be beneficial or even necessary when exercising is sodium. And it's only in specific cases. Compared to the amounts consumed in our diet, we lose very little of the other elements in our sweat, so much so that supplementation just isn't warranted. Sure, most people could do with more potassium and maybe more magnesium or iodine, but you can also get these in a multivitamin or ideally through your diet. I personally use a potassium salt substitute that costs about two euro for a three month supply. We do lose quite a bit of chloride in our sweat and it's paired with sodium, but there's literally zero research on chloride during exercise. And it doesn't seem to be that important in cases of hyponatremia where the subjects receive sodium citrate. So it's not like Derek's product is bad or worse than others, but it's just that sodium seems to be the only ingredient of importance when it comes to sweating. So the question is, when is it important and how much of it do you need? Well, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. You see, sodium doesn't actually have any performance benefits per se. I talked about this in a previous video, but it has a relationship with hydration status, which does have an impact on performance. There are two types of scenarios that can realistically happen during exercise. Dehydration, where you simply just drink too little, and hyponatremia, where your blood sodium concentrations get diluted below 135 millimoles per liter, which severe cases of are really rare, but can be fatal. So let's start there. When we sweat, we lose electrolytes, which are taken from our blood, but our sweat is always hypotonic, meaning that in comparison to the composition of our blood, we lose more water, relatively speaking. That means the concentration of sodium in our blood per remaining liter increases. It's a protective mechanism against hyponatremia. So if you drink less than you sweat, your blood sodium concentrations or osmolality will nearly always be higher than when you started training. Sounds great, but what about about dehydration. Of course, everyone knows that you need to drink. Sure, if you don't drink, you won't get hyponatremia, but you might get severely dehydrated. However, this is where a lot of people are misguided. Multiple research papers have suggested that anything less than 1% drop in body weight is likely just a normal daily fluctuation. So you're not really classified as even being mildly dehydrated until you go above that 1% threshold. Dehydration occurs along a spectrum, and it's not a matter of if it impacts performance, but rather at what level. In this paper, looking at drinking behaviors of elite marathon runners, Haile Gabriel Siasi, who at the time was a world record holder, lost 9.8% of his total body weight in the Dubai Marathon. This isn't obviously something I recommend, but it shows that it's not so clear cut. Most research indicates that at 2% dehydration, endurance performance starts to become impaired, as does cognitive performance, and football skill and basketball skill. By the time you hit 4%, muscular strength will be impaired. And by the time you hit 10%, you'll likely experience muscle spasms and delirium. And in all of this research, dehydration is simply calculated by by loss in body weight. So unless you know what percentage of your body weight you've lost during exercise, you've really no idea how much you're dehydrated by. Here's a basic calculation of how to do it on screen right now. So some dehydration is probably not too bad and will have a little or no impact on performance, but major dehydration will. Two to 3% maximum is generally the consensus amongst most hydration researchers if you want to maintain performance. In Derek's video, he talks about all of these negative consequences of dehydration, but he doesn't give you this percentage breakdown, which I think is really important because from watching that two and a half hour 
video that he made, I get the impression that any dehydration should be avoided at all costs, which isn't clearly the case. So how does all of this relate back to electrolytes? Well, in certain scenarios, in order to avoid going over that 2% dehydration threshold, we're gonna have to replace some water losses. For example, if you do a 30 minute run, you don't need to drink any water at all because chances are you won't lose anywhere near 2% of your body weight. But if you do a four hour marathon, you likely will. Now, if we're constantly drinking and replacing that sweat, eventually our blood sodium levels will start to get depleted to the point of mild hyponatremia unless we start to replace that sodium. But where is that point and how much sodium should we actually replace? Well, without knowing your sweat rate and your sodium sweat concentrations, it's impossible to know. It's gonna be a stab in the dark and that's what most people do. They drink when they're thirsty and they take electrolytes because some company told them that it's good for them or that they need it. Sweat rates can vary, but on average across most sports, people sweat at around a rate of one to one and a half liters per hour. The bigger you are, the more likely that you will sweat more. And in extreme cases, some people can sweat up to three liters per hour, but it's really rare. It's important to note that heat acclimation will reduce sweat rates significantly. This is why teams often go to warm countries for pre-tournament camps. The average person's sweat sodium concentration levels are about 35 to 40 millimoles a liter, which is about a thousand milligrams or one gram per liter of sweat. If you want to know your sweat rate, you can do the simple test that I previously mentioned. So you want to make sure you drink enough to avoid dehydration and performance degradation, but not so much hypotonic water to the point where your body is overloaded with water and you dilute your blood sodium concentrations. Dr. Alan McCubbin, who researches electrolyte supplementation at the University of Monash in Australia, has used an equation based off of these averages to calculate the maximum amount of sweat replaced through drinking before you would need to consume sodium to keep your blood concentrations in a safe range. That ends up working out to be about 70% across four hours of exercise. The shorter the time, the less relevant the electrolytes become to stay in that safe zone, which we'll see later on. They use this predictive equation on screen to calculate when is 70% replacement or more actually needed? Alan has broken it down into three questions, which you have to answer yes to all of. Number one, is 70% or more beneficial for maintaining good hydration? In other words, no more than 2% dehydration. For example, if you weigh 100 kilos and you sweat two liters per hour, which is very high, two hours and only drink one liter per hour, by the end of that two hours, you're just starting to hit that 2% dehydration and you've only replaced 50% of your sweat. Number two, is it physically possible for me to drink that much? In some scenarios, you just can't drink enough. If you're a heavy sweater, your gut may not be able to handle the amount of liquid, particularly when you're exercising. Most people who've done endurance sports before will know what I'm talking about here. Number three, is it practical? Think of scenarios like a football or soccer match or you're out for a longer run. You might not have the opportunities to drink the fluid. Unless you can say yes to all of those, you probably don't need to consider electrolyte supplementation. And this is another area where people start to go wrong. They assume not only do I need to replace all my sweat, but I need to replace all of my sodium losses. That couldn't be further from the truth. In a recent paper, Dr. McCubbin rearranged the previous equation that I showed you so they could calculate how much sodium you might need to replace in different scenarios. What they found was that a soccer player playing 90 minutes with an average sweat rate and an average sweat sodium concentration wouldn't have to replace any sodium whatsoever. And it's not unless you are the heaviest sweater with above average sweat sodium concentrations that you would need to even start to consider replacing sodium in your diet. It does get more important as you exercise more because you're drinking more and hence replacing more of your sweat. I think it's a little ironic that Derek says their product is intended for people who exercise for one to two hours and not for endurance athletes, when in reality, endurance athletes are the ones with the highest potential to actually benefit from an electrolyte supplement. It's not unreasonable to say that if you are an extremely heavy sweater and salty sweater, and for some reason you decide to replace all of your sweat during exercise, you might need to supplement with sodium, but that isn't a recommended strategy by any practitioner who's well-informed and it can be dangerous. So you can see electrolyte supplementation is complex. It's not as simple as just saying our product is more efficacious than another company. Sodium isn't something that you run out of. It's more about the concentration and balance in your blood, which is dynamic. And a final word on fasting, because I know this is an area of interest for a lot of people. Drinking during exercise is different than drinking throughout the day. Usually when we drink, our body switches off antidiuretic hormone, otherwise known as arginine vasopressin, and we pee more. You've probably experienced this in the past, but during exercise, this doesn't happen for several reasons and we can overload the kidneys, hence electrolyte importance in certain scenarios. With that said, after this eight day water fast only, the subjects had blood sodium concentrations that would consider them hyponatremic. So if you're gonna fast for longer periods of time, electrolytes might be a good idea, especially if you intend to exercise. Personally, don't recommend fasting for that long. So where does that leave us? Well, if you're serious about hydration, you should calculate your sweat rate. I'll put a link down below, but again, it's the really easy formula. If you exercise for less than three to four hours, drinking the thirst is a solid strategy. Blood osmolality is a major factor in our thirst levels and add salt to taste, but specific electrolyte strategies are unlikely to make a difference for most people. This is the 
plan that I will be following when I do an upcoming half marathon. If you think you are a really salty sweater and you will be drinking more than 70% of your sweat losses, you might consider a sweat sodium test or just going by averages or norms and replacing 50% of the average person's sweat sodium losses, which would be about 500 milligrams per liter. I do think that more meticulous planning and strategizing for these longer events are definitely warranted. So overall, it's not that electrolyte supplements aren't useful, but if we're really going to be following a realistic scientific approach, it's really only when you get into those insurance territories do they become relevant. There's no major downsides to taking them other than making you more thirsty, which ironically can lead to over drinking and further dilution of blood sodium. But if you want to take them and you think you might benefit from them, then that's fine by me. But I certainly think there is a case for a little more critical thinking in general. I'm just here trying to give you the full informed picture. And if you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate a subscribe and you might like this other video that I made on LMS.